Are you hashtag blessed? Do y'all use hashtags? I don't really use hashtags. But anyways, what does that word blessed mean? Psalm 84 gets into all that. We're going to talk about that today. And then also for our Bad Doctrine of the Week, we are wrapping up finally our Sparkle Creed series. And we're going to ask ourselves, I believe, help my unbelief. Is that a biblical statement? And is that good doctrine or bad doctrine? We're going to figure out all that and more today on the Digging Deeper podcast. Well, good morning or good afternoon. Welcome to the Digging Deeper podcast. Our goal here is to dig a little bit deeper into that week's sermon, so that way we might dig it a little bit deeper into our hearts. My name is Chris Brown, and I'm the associate pastor here. My name is Jacob Belding. I'm the Connections Minister. And I'm Judah. I'm back. Make sure to like and subscribe. Yeah, Judah's back. We're all back. Mm-hmm. We took a, a break uh, or a, a one-week hiatus because um, of Journey to Bethlehem, right? That's yep. why we did Okay. Uh, and Jude has been gone for two weeks, so we're all back for you right here. We are glad that you all joined us here today. Before we get into this, I've got some very, um, very good news, I think, for you, Jacob, because uh, you're a huge Taylor Swift fan, right? I uh, like great news about Taylor Swift. Did y'all see that she's Time's Person of the Year? I did not see that. (laughs) She is the Person of the Year. So, I just Uh, thought that you would be happy hmm. about that. Interesting. Um, Uh, Based on what merit? um, I think based on that she's like... A celebrity. A celebrity. (laughs) Like, like biggest movie. Um, She was in a movie? Oh, she did like a documentary thing. I haven't seen that at all. I assume it's about her. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> uh, like, she re-recorded all of her albums, and so, like, they're all, like, on the top charts. You know, her concert tour thing was, like, mm-hmm. crazy huge. She dated that one guy. Travis Kelsey. Yeah, and then now... So, somehow she dominated sports as well. <laughs> um yeah, that's it's true. <laughs> yeah, and so so time is like who else would we give it to? Right. Um and so anyways, I just thought tidbit of information for you. Um and if y'all are Taylor Swift fans out there and if you are, you're I don't know why you're watching this. <laughs> um but, uh we we all know here uh that we we've, we've learned that Jacob is a huge Taylor Swift fan and so we thought he might want to know that. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> all right. Well, we're glad that y'all joined us here today. Um, we get to dig into this week's sermon, which is my sermon. Yeah, I got to preach this month, and you're probably wondering, where's my iPad? I forgot my iPad at home, so we're going old school. Oh, uh, Bible. But I'll tell you this. I have prepped extensively for this podcast, so I don't even need notes. It's all up here in my brain. Well, but, that's good, because you preached the sermon on Sunday, so you I've, should know it. I've right? slept since then, though, so <laughs> I don't even remember what I said. Um, anyways, this is um, about Psalm eighty-four. This is about Psalm eighty-four, uh, and as customary, I'm not going to recap. You're going to recap, and I'm going to judge you. All right, as you do. So there were three points. Three points to this sermon. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking, I know. Three points. <laughs> it's a great. Specific recap so far. Right. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> now, um, <laughs> as I was listening, I did have to go back and correct the points because at the very beginning, you did say, hey, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, resting in, uh, or what was it? I don't remember because I deleted it and wrote mm-hmm. down what the actual point was. But uh, I said it backwards. Yeah, yeah, you said it backwards yeah. uh, the first time mm-hmm. and, and said, uh, Okay, for everybody that's not going to listen to the rest of the sermon, you just want to hear the points, that's it. So mm-hmm. you can check out now and tune out. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to go back and, and flip those. But mm-hmm. the first one, the first point is God is our rest. Second point, God is our strength. Mm-hmm. And then finally, God is our peace. Yeah, And this is how backwards sorry, I got. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's not right. God is our joy. Oh, you're right. Yeah. God I, is our joy. I, I totally that's why I give her an opportunity. <laughs> um, uh, so this is how backwards it got. So at the beginning there, I said, um, uh, what, how did I say it? Um, that you need to find rest in God. Finding rest in God. Yeah. Finding strength in God. Yeah. And then joy. later on, I said, God is your rest. God is your peace. On my actual notes, it was the Lord is your rest. <laughs> the Lord is your peace. So I just got it completely out of whack. 
Um, it worked. It, it well, worked. Um, we got the point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's the points. You're missing a, a, a big piece of it, though. This is where I judge you for your Glory recap. to glory? No, uh, no, no, no. There's a, the whole premise of it. What's the premise of the sermon? Oh, uh, the whole premise. Okay. So I was just doing the points. I'll mm-hmm. get to the premise, right? Mm-hmm. When it comes to those points, it's really answering the question of how we can be content regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what's going on uh, in our relationships, um, our jobs, all those different sorts of things. Mm-hmm. How to find contentment yeah. and joy and happiness Yes, in God. Yep. Exactly. And you started off by uh, telling everybody to basically disregard everything that they thought that they knew about Psalm uh, 103 and blessedness. Yeah, about the word bless. Yeah. Um, because there's multiple words. Hebrew's funny. It's almost like, a, it's like the word bat in English. Mm-hmm. It's like I could say, I'm going to swing a bat at you. Uh, and then I can also say, I'm going to swing a bat at a bat. Yeah. It's a, like, same word, but two completely different right. meanings, right? Uh, and it's all based on context. Uh, similar with Hebrew mm-hmm. uh, is, uh, well, I guess... They have their own word, though. Yeah, yeah, it's a completely separate word. So, this is this is where the English language falls a little bit short. Yeah. Uh, it's not as expansive and as minute as right. Hebrew or Greek. Uh, we just don't have a good word for uh to differentiate between the two of them yeah and there's actually so so digging into this so so the word so psalm 103 the pastor we went through the word is barak mm-hmm. um for the word bless which means like thanksgiving praise and the word for blessed here in psalm 84 is asher which more means like joy happiness um, there's actually a lot of, uh, as, as you probably know, uh, a lot of debate on should that word even be translated blessed? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, because does that word mean what it used to mean? Right. Uh, is kind of the question. And so, so whenever, you know, back in the day, if you said, hey, I'm blessed, everyone knew exactly what that meant. And now there's like an ethereal, like... What exactly does that mean now? Mm-hmm. And so Randy Alcorn, who wrote that giant book on happiness that uh, you walked in on me reading, uh, he he would argue that we shouldn't translate blessed at yeah. all, um, just because it doesn't actually get the point across anymore right. that, that it used to, um, that a better translation would be joy or happiness right. um, to actually get the point across. Um, yeah, and I, had a, uh, I took a Sermon on the Mount class um, a couple of years ago now. A year and a half ago, something like that. <coughs> and uh, the professor, um, he wrote a, a full commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. It was really, really good. Uh, but uh, he's dealing with the New Testament instead of the Old Testament. He talked about Asher and the, the difference mm-hmm. between those. Um, but he's dealing with the Greek, right? Makarios, mm-hmm. uh, uh, which is which are macarisms, right? And so, like, in the Beatitudes, right? Which, by, by the way, in case you didn't pick that up, uh, Makarios is the Greek word right. for Asher. Yes. Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Um, and so, his uh, the way that he translated, because he did his own translation for uh, the Sermon on the Mount, the way that he translated the Beatitudes was uh, flourishing are those mm. who, yeah. uh, they each of them started off that way. Yeah. It's sort of a, a roadmap, a, a wisdom, mm-hmm. a literature kind of a roadmap. Um, to true human flourishing. That was his whole point in <coughs> happiness, joy. It's mm-hmm. like, those are good. He likes flourishing. I mm-hmm. thought that was interesting. Yeah, so the um, the it, it sounds minute, and it sounds, yeah. it, it sounds unnecessary to get that deep into it. Um, but the argument, or at least Randy Alcorn's argument, and maybe even your professor's argument, is um, the... In God is flourishing, right? Not not necessarily like prosperity and like the health and wealth sense, right. but like flourishing and joy and happiness, and that's part of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there, uh, I think sometimes there's a misconception that the gospel is you setting aside your happiness to go find God, and no, it's uh, the gospel is you find your happiness in God. Right. And um, Randy Alcorn's argument is that if all of our language is centered around, you can go find happiness in the world, but here you find God. Um, it's like the average person is going to be like, I, I want to be happy though. <laughs> right. It's like, 
okay, well, if I have to give up happiness, then I'm going to, okay, I guess I won't go to God. And it creates a, a false dichotomy where a, a better way to present it is if you want to actually find happiness, then you'll find that in God. Right. And the words that we use are important. And so if you say, you know, like, blessed are the meek, blessed are the low in spirit, um, it used to communicate the same thing, but now the average person listening to that is like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go be happy over here. And so if, like, you, yeah, you know, if you translate more to like flourishing or joyful or happy, now it kind of, there's no misconception. Right. It makes know, more on what's sense. actually trying to communicate. Ironically enough, the CSB, which is what I normally use, translates this happy. Oh, really? Did you notice I used ESV? Um, I did not, actually. Yeah. I should have picked up on that. I used ESV um, today, and the reason I did is because it was more poetic. And, uh, I, yeah. and it kind of like makes, opened yeah. up the door to like unpack Explain. Blessed yeah. and, and Asher and what that means. Well, that's good, because, uh, you know, I mean, we have a, there's a lot of people that have a lot of different translations here. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Pastor Lee likes his NIV. I know you like the CSB. I like the ESV, and there's tons, like King James, even, we have... Members that like King James, New King James, all all the different translations, and so uh, yeah, taking the opportunity that was a good move. Yes, yeah. nice, nice yeah. dude. Yeah, gold yeah. star for Chris. Well, so um, <laughs> and th- that's one of the things. So in the in that book that Randy Alcorn wrote on this, he posed the question: Okay, well, if this is a better translation for it, if like happiness, joy, flourishing is a better translation for Asher or Macarius, then why do we still use blessed? And one of the things he said is, it's more poetic. It sounds better. It sounds better. <laughs> yeah. It sounds more spiritual. Um, Happy are the poor in spirit. I know. It, just, the kingdom of God, it, yeah. it doesn't have the same like poetic nature to it. And um, Blessed. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah. And so, <clears throat> it's funny. He was combating that point uh, in that book. And then I went ahead and used this <laughs> translation because it was right. more poetic. <laughs> He's over there like, here's this great case for using happy or joyous or or joyful or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But we'll just stick with blessed because it sounds sounds better. (laughs) Sounds better that way. (laughs) Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. So anyways, so that's kind of the whole, yeah, thing of this this sermon is digging into, um, okay, if blessedness is flourishing, joyful, happy, how does it say that we achieve that? And then we we walk through it in the the sermon. But yeah. Yes. And the um, you brought this point up, or you brought this up in your third point, but uh, the connection with the sons of Korah. Uh, mm-hmm. It even says that it's, it's part of the scripture that it's uh, that these are the guys that wrote this mm-hmm. particular uh, psalm, and that they were uh, doorkeepers uh, of the tabernacle. <laughs> Um, which makes sense uh, after reading the psalm. It's like, okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, they literally talk about being doorkeepers. Yeah, and it's somewhere else. I don't know off the top of my head, but um, I think it's in Second Samuel um, that you see the scripture that they were appointed doorkeepers, yeah. that that lineage was. Um, I think there's three scriptures in total that mention the sons of Korah. Um, maybe, maybe only two. Outside of the psalms, I think there may only be two, and one of them was when they were appointed doorkeepers and custodians. And then another was um, when they were like part of uh, David's crew. Yeah. Um, when I think when he was running from Saul. Yeah, they were uh, they were even doorkeepers for David uh, mm-hmm. uh, or under David. And then I think some of them uh, fought with David. Yeah, yeah. If I remember right. Yeah, so I think that's the only other two mentions of the descendants of Korah uh, in the Old Testament besides... The start of Korah and yeah. the, the mentions in the Psalms. Yes. So not a whole lot. Uh, not a lot to go off not, of. Not a lot to go off of. No. But it's interesting, right? Because mm-hmm. when we open up the Psalms, I mean, oh, um, most of them are written by David. Mm-hmm. Or it's kind of what we expect, right? And then it's like, oh, sons of Korah, who are these guys? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's it's funny. So, so if you don't know, the Psalms are basically like uh, poetry... Uh, like actual like songs of the day that they would sing, so they would write it, and so it's it's it says a psalm of the sons of Korah. Mm-hmm. Was that like their band? 
<laughs> Did they have a band name called Sons of Korah? Uh, there is a band called Sons of Korah. Is it really? Yeah. Oh. And they sing psalms. <laughs> really? That's funny. Yeah. So, but back then, yeah, yeah, do you think yeah. that, do, do you think that was a thing? Like they had like music groups? Oh, and, I'm sure they did. And they were like, hey, let's just be the Sons of Korah. We'll start it, in my garage. Yeah. My it, parents' garage. It's like Shane and Shane. Yeah. They're like, what do we call ourselves? It's like, well, your name is Shane <laughs> and my name is Shane. <laughs> right. So we'll just call each other Shane and, we'll call Shane, and Shane. Yeah. Easy. And so these guys, you know, getting together, you know, writing psalms and singing them, going around. Like, it's like they're, like, by day they're doorkeepers and on the weekends they, like, hit up all the... <laughs> <laughs> they go, <laughs> they're gigging. <laughs> yeah, they're gigging and singing songs and, and they're like, what do we call ourselves? It's like... Well, we're, we're all a family, and we're the sons of Korah, so sons of Korah. Yeah, sounds great. I'd be really curious if that's you know what they were doing. Must have been a bad boy band when they got their start. Because <laughs> right? nobody and, – and that's why it's – part of the reason it's interesting, because mm-hmm. if you've ever read about the account of Korah or listened to your sermon mm-hmm. uh, Sunday, right, you get some of the background of who Korah was and how he messed up yeah. royally. And so, yeah, just reading that, it's like – Sons of Cora, like who would name their band after? It would be like Sons of Benedict Arnold. Or it something. makes me think that these are like angsty teenagers, right? Um, right exactly. That they're just trying to like get a little edge. Yeah, on yeah, their, they're edgy. That's yeah. exactly right. Uh, and so it, it's interesting. Um, I, I'd I'd be interested to know uh, what that is. Uh, but yeah, so the Psalms are interesting because like a lot of the Psalms we we don't have a whole lot of context to. Right. A lot of them they're they're just poetry or songs. And the context is the psalm itself. Right. But then there's a handful of psalms that, that you actually have further context outside of the psalms, like Psalm 51 yeah. is a great one, uh, where, where David uh, wrote the psalm after losing his child um, due to the, the stuff that happened with Uriah and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And knowing that context opens up that psalm a whole lot. Right. Like kind of in the same thing here, knowing that this is the psalm, uh, Sons of Korah. Mm-hmm opens up the psalm a whole lot uh, with with deeper context. And so this is one of those interesting ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. All right, well, let's go on and get into it. So the first... By the way, I keep coughing because I'm still getting over a cold. Uh, mm. So we I'm sorry. You. I'm sorry. It's okay. You have to hear my coughing. We will push through somehow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we could get through a smooth jazz voice, Chris, yeah. on Sunday, I think we can probably yeah. handle some coughing. It's slightly <laughs> less jazzy today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, the jazz uh, jazz voice was good. Mm-hmm. I think that should just be your normal preaching voice. I would. Just, uh, <laughs> did you ever watch Hey Arnold? Oh, yeah. Growing up? Uh, <laughs> Judah, do you even know what Hey Arnold is? No idea. He was too young. <laughs> too young. Yeah. So Hey Arnold was this uh, Nickelodeon cartoon, and there was this one kid that uh, had to get his tonsils removed. And uh, after he got his tonsils removed, his voice was like very like low and raspy. And he was, like, all upset about it. And then this, like, I think it was a jazz singer, like a scat guy, like, came up, and he had a low raspy voice. He's like, hey, man, that voice is awesome. You can do this. And from that point forward, he's like, oh, yeah, I've got a nice got like, it. jazz voice. <laughs> That's what it makes me think of. Hey, Arnold. <laughs> anyway. I hadn't thought of that show in forever. <laughs> yeah. The weirdest, like, cartoon animation, uh, like the way they like oh, depicted yeah. their bodies and whatnot. Yeah, it's, it's like they're odd. flat and like their legs are just folded. Yeah, their ears are like down to here. Anyways, um, that's weird. Right. <laughs> Judah's looking it up. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's, uh, that's old school cartoons right there. 1996. Yeah. Sounds about right. That and Rocco's Modern Life. Uh, uh, did you ever watch uh, that? I didn't watch that. Oh, man, that was a good one. How about Johnny Bravo? Oh, yeah. Johnny Bravo. <laughs> that one couldn't, that couldn't be on that, TV Yeah, it couldn't be made today. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, he's yeah. so funny. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what were you saying? Point number one. Uh, God is our rest, mm-hmm. which uh, is Psalm 84, verses 1 through 4. All right. Yeah, you want to read it? Yep. <clears throat> How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Selah. (laughs) Yeah, Selah. Yeah, throw that in there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and when I said, so at the beginning I said this, uh, Psalm breaks itself down into three parts. Um, 
based on that. It's yeah, it's, it's literally the sailors, the pauses, um, literally break itself down into three parts. Yeah. Yep. It sure does. Mm. <clears throat> so uh, this one was interesting. So um, uh, everybody else doesn't know, but the the Psalms album that they just came out with, Worship Initiative, mm-hmm. and Well Riders uh, did. Uh, I think it's the first track on that album uh, is based on this psalm. And then there's mm-hmm. another one, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm thinking of that first one mm-hmm. where they're talking about sparrows. Uh, even the sparrow finds a home and mm-hmm. kind of going on. It's a pretty part of the song. Mm-hmm. So I think mm-hmm. that's where the Shanes kind of pipe in and they've got those harmonies. Yeah. They're just so good. I don't yeah. know. Um, but uh, uh, can you kind of explain uh, that for us just a little bit? I think you did on Sunday, uh, but you know what is it that they're getting at? Yeah. So uh, so again, this the psalm I believe is through the vantage point of a doorkeeper mm-hmm. uh, in the tabernacle. And just in case you don't know, the tabernacle in Jerusalem, or at, at this point in time, uh, well, wondering depending on when this was written mm-hmm. it was either the still the portable tent meeting just set up in Jerusalem or the actual finished you know temple right. um uh, in Solomon um depends on when this was written but either way effectively yeah. it's the same thing uh they're they're at the tabernacle in Jerusalem and at the tabernacle is where the Jews and the followers of God would congregate uh to come worship God to uh make their sacrifices to God and so this guy, um, the doorkeeper, is just literally spending his day as a doorkeeper, like uh, as people come in. And so he's watching people come in, and there's altars. I think there's a few altars outside of the the temple, and then there's an altar inside the temple, right? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, like within the temple court? Yeah, because I think there's like the general altars that you would come make your, your general sacrifices. And then there was in the Holy Holies yeah. a, a separate one. For that, right, um, and so, so anyway, so, so this guy, through the vantage point of a doorkeeper, uh, I, th- I think he's just kind of recounting what he's seeing, and um, how he loves the dwelling place of God, which at that time, the temple, the the tabernacle was the, I don't want to say literal, but literal uh, dwelling place of God. He dwelled in the holy of holies. A um, little bit different today, uh, yeah. but it's his footstool. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, so it's almost like he's standing there and he's he's reflecting on the the dwelling place of God and how he's found a home in the dwelling place of God. And I I find it really interesting how he compares it to the birds because it's almost like he's like just looking at the the trees and seeing the birds. And they may even have trees that were like among the altars. Um, and so uh, it's interesting. They says, you know, even a sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars. And so, so I think what he's getting at here is that if the birds, which are worth, uh, what, how's Jesus phrase it? They're worth a penny or whatever. Or far, yeah, far less than yeah, any of us. Um, yeah, if the birds are worth far less than any of us who are, are able to find a home among God and his altars, then surely we can, right? Like, like surely we can find our home here as well. Uh, and then kind of correlating that to rest. Mm-hmm. You know, like like uh, a home isn't just four walls, home is rest. And uh, then kind of translating that to the, how do we actually find our rest in God um, and not find burden in God, but find rest in God. And uh, you know, then correlating that to you know Hebrews and all that. Yeah, yeah. I really like the uh, uh, your illustration that you use. There's no place like home, um, and that's true. Mm-hmm. So even I, mean, <coughs> I don't know about you. Anytime that I'm like we're traveling and we're having to stay in a hotel or motel or whatever, it's like I might be just exhausted and super tired, but I'm not going to sleep good uh, no. in a hotel. Uh, yeah. I do bring my own pillow. Mm-hmm. And that helps a little bit, mm-hmm. um, but no, uh, there's that's just you have to get home to get some like actual sleep. Yeah, there's different noises. Uh, your kids are in the same room with you now, mm-hmm. and the uh, bed feels different, and you're just gone. Like you're if you're traveling, there's there's thoughts of like oh, like okay, there, there's unknowns that you got to deal with, or even if you're staying with family, um, you know it. it 
everything can be great. Like, like it's not it's not that there's like lingering tension or anything, right. but it's just not your home. Um, and so, so you can find rest, but it's it's, it's different. Yeah, it's different rest. Um, and so, yeah. Um, yeah, it's not like a full rest mm-hmm. or a complete rest, right? Mm-hmm. Partial, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, you have to sleep. Um, <coughs> that's that's part of that's part of the deal, mm-hmm. right? And we'll get sleep, but yeah. there's a difference between that kind of sleep and then like a deep mm-hmm. rest and yeah. something that really is rejuvenating. And yeah, and then the uh, is correlating that to like Hebrews, where it's talking about us finding our rest in God, and our rest in God is only found when. Uh, the work is finished, mm-hmm. right? And so, if we're working, uh, if we're trying to, you know, have workspace salvation, then we'll never find rest in God. And it's saying that you have to first set those aside before you can find rest. And I and I don't think I got into this, but that was really the main concept of the tabernacle mm-hmm. of the temple is that when you came in to give your sacrifice, it was you saying, "I can't do this. Something is taking my place." And doing the work for me, mm-hmm. um, and so even back then, if if you were like gonna, if you're one of those people that lean in the Old Testament and say, "Oh, look at all the the stuff they had to do and all the rules they had to follow," even the the rules they had to follow and the sacrificing, um, illustrated that they're here not to work for their salvation, but to place the work onto something else. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, they had to have a mediator. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Between them and God, uh, <coughs> just like we do, we have to have uh, Christ, right? Mm-hmm. He's our mediator. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not like uh, they could just stroll in and I'm here to sprinkle blood on the on the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant today. Mm-hmm. It's like no, that's not how this works. Yeah, uh, you had to have the priest uh, mm-hmm. to do that for you. So even there, and I know what you're saying too. Uh, like the fact that they're bringing sacrifices at all demonstrates that like. They can't. Do yeah, this they're, work on they're their own. there to, uh, in a sense, lay their burden at the altar. Right, right, uh, and then that burden is taken care of. Uh, and like you're saying, now that's Christ. Yeah. Right, when you know Christ said, "Come, all you heavy and laden, burden." Um, uh, we lay our burden of sin on Christ, and then Christ deals with it. Mm-hmm. Right, as the mediator and the sacrifice yes. Uh, in one. Yes, um, the perfect sacrifice once yeah. for all. Uh, and it's funny, too, when you were talking about, um, uh, you know, there's no place like home and talking about rest. I actually had written out Hebrews 4. Oh, yeah. And then you got to That's it. That's where like, oh, yes. my mind immediately goes to that. Uh, uh, like I, uh, the, the, so usually how I outline my sermons is, you know, I'll, you know, I'll read the passage, kind of break it down into rough points uh, that the passage lays out. And then I'll just write down like cross reference scriptures, mm-hmm. and that was the first one I've written out. Hebrews four. My mind went straight to classic. To you know that that's how we find our rest in God. Yeah, yeah. it was a good mm-hmm. one. Uh, I liked it. Um. So yeah, yeah. Uh, works working to gain salvation to be approved by God never uh, leads to lasting rest because we're always having to strive and, uh, we can't do it mm-hmm. anyway. So it's like, you know, a dog chasing its tail. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, there's, you're not going to catch it. Um, and even if you did, um, you wouldn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Anyway. Well, in, and in the, the illustration I gave of, you know, the unfinished house projects. Um, so there's, there's two types of, of, Couples or families looking for homes. One is the I want a completed home. That's my wife. Yeah, it's like <laughs> I, I don't want. I don't even want to paint. I don't want to do anything. I just want to move in and be done. And then there's the ones that are like, I am not paying for a completed home because I can just do it myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they're looking for like the dilapidated, falling mm-hmm. apart house that they can just renovate. And it's funny. Um, we've told multiple people that, that, you know, we renovated our home or we're in the middle of renovations. And one of the things um, people respond with uh, is, um, that will ruin your marriage. <laughs> like, uh, your marriage will just fall apart if you're in the middle of a, a renovation. And uh, and luckily, that's not the case for us. Uh, we, we've been pretty smooth through it all. But I can see how it could because... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because you're living in a place of – you're living in a, in a construction zone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so not only do you have the the aspect of you can't fully rest because your house isn't a home, um, at least fully, 
Uh, but the utility of those areas are gone too, and it can cause like just uneasiness and tension and whatnot. Oh, I've lived that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, at our old house, um, man, there were, uh, I, I did two bathroom projects mm -hmm. and, oh man, uh, talk about, uh, my wife is so patient with me, uh, but <laughs> to a point and then she just gets frustrated with me mm -hmm. and then, uh, it's like, okay, I've got, I have to do this. I've got to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, yes, uh, it can't be stressful. Mm -hmm. uh, Randy's so easygoing. Oh, really? Like, like really all the pressure was self induced uh on my so man so i'm the sam in that situation <laughs> where like i'm mad at myself that i haven't got done and randy's just so go with the flow uh, uh that it's all she, good she, she'll make it work mm -hmm. um or at least if she's frustrated she didn't tell me right um and um, i did get those yeah. projects done yeah it, it took being under the gun to ha need to get it finished mm -hmm. to sell the house but mm -hmm. you know yeah it's it's part of it. But yeah, it's, you know, it just kind of communicates that point of, uh, you know, rest is found in completed work. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you haven't trusted in the complete work of God, then you don't have rest. Uh, and you never will have rest until that's the case because there's unfinished work. Uh, and I love how that, that Hebrews passage correlates it to the work and the creation. And this is why I tell people when I preach on rest is um, like, like physical rest, like physical Sabbath rest, is if at all possible, have your Sabbath be at the end of your week. Mm -hmm. um, so that way all of your work is done. Like, like So like if, if you have in the middle of the week and you still have lingering work, well, now your rest isn't going to be fully rest mm -hmm. because now you're thinking about all the stuff you still have to do. And so if you can get all of your work completely done, now your rest can be full rest because there's nothing lingering. There's no procrastination that's going on. Uh, oh, it's and, the worst. Yeah, yeah, and it just um, uh, it it mirrors and correlates to uh, the creation story where God didn't you know work three days, rest one, and then finish mm -hmm. working. No, he he got all the work done completely and then rested. Yeah, we live in a in a weird society though, yeah, we and do. so that's not always possible. And so I, I get that, uh, but yeah, if, if at all possible, structure your week to where. Yeah. That's the case. Yeah, it's not like there's a you know society wide. We all have decided to work for six days, and then everything is closed. On it that used last day. to be, I know it did. and it's just not that way anymore. And that I'm a little sad by that. Uh, and it it just it it makes it hard, uh, especially when you have kids. Yeah. Um, anyway, this isn't a this isn't a <laughs> rest. We're a podcast rest. on physical rest. Um, but spiritual rest. Right. Um, so I don't want to get too deep into that. But. Well, it's like spiritual rest Sundays now is abstaining from Chick-fil-A and Hobby Lobby. Yeah. Honestly, I don't consider Sundays my Sabbath. I consider Saturdays. Uh, um, Fridays are closer for me. Anyway. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sunday, no. <laughs> yeah, Fridays have been so hectic for me that, that that's not the case. So, okay, we're into it. Um, uh, yeah. All right, so in... Uh, <laughs> In Exodus, or is it Exodus? Maybe it's a little bit of cool law. I can't remember. But when it's talking about the Sabbath, they have what's kind of known as like a prep day, um, where the day before you do everything that you need to do on... So so let's say it's Saturday is mm -hmm. the Sabbath. Then Friday is your prep day for Saturday. So everything that you would have done on Saturday, you prep it all on Friday. So that way Saturday you don't have to do anything. Right. And so the way I used to do it um, back when I was single is Friday, I would get literally every single thing I could possibly get done, done. Like, I'd get the house clean, all that. So, I wake up on Saturday, and the literally the only thing I have to think about on Saturday is, okay, what do I need to do today to just relax and enjoy myself? And it was a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, now I have kids, <laughs> and it's so much harder. <laughs> and, and rest just looks different now. Yeah. Um, and... And I just have to strive all the more uh, when I preached on it. Um, it was before I had kids, but I made the statement of like, um, there's no exemption from the Sabbath because you have kids. Uh, and so, is it harder? Yes. But you, you just have to work that much harder. And I fail a lot of the times yeah. at it. Um, but it's still necessary. Well, the kids need rest too. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, you can you can tell, especially uh, ours are, are in school and... It was right then before Thanksgiving. You just tell they were exhausted. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you know, there's a lot of other things going on for them besides school. Like, oh, we have you know, like sports on Saturday or running mm -hmm. around doing this and that, church Sunday, and then we were right back in it. 
and for them, uh, you know, having that, they had a week off of school. Uh, the older two kids did anyway, and you could tell that as it was getting closer to Thanksgiving break, like they needed a break. Mm-hmm. It, it was time uh, for them to get some yeah. rest that way. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. yeah it's just convincing rest. them that yeah. they need a break. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, I'm not tired. And they're over there, like, barely keep their eyes open. I'm not ready. I don't want to go to bed. <laughs> Lottie's getting old enough now that she'll actually admit it. She'll say, oh, really? like, I'm tired. I, like, I want to close my eyes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, the other one, we can't get to, to admit it. No. <laughs> no. Anyways, all right. We're ne- going long. Yeah. Next um, point. Next point. Next point. Point number two <clears throat> God is our strength which is based on Psalm 84, 5 through 9. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of, Buc- is it Baca? I said Baca. Baca. Um, but it, it, uh, I didn't look up the official pronun- pronunciation. So Baca. I like yeah. that better anyway. Yeah. Um, as they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. So this one, uh, you you made the the observation that it seems that these doorkeepers are recounting the journey that people take mm-hmm. to actually get up to mm-hmm. Zion, to get to Jerusalem, to get to uh, the temple. Yeah, because uh, so so this is in Jerusalem, city of David, Zion, as as they would mm-hmm. refer to it back then. Um, not from the Matrix. Not, is there a thing called Zion in the Matrix? Have you not seen the Matrix? Oh, it's been so long. Oh, dude, uh, uh, that's like the human city that's safe from the machines. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. Oh, nice biblical reference there. Oh, that, uh, uh, Trinity uh, is one of the characters, and they have all oh, yeah, kinds of little yeah. things. That's not all. Christian, overtly, yeah, yeah. you know, Christian or anything. But um, anyway, I digress. Yeah. So, just in case you, you know, so there's Israel, and again, depending on when this was written, um, yeah. you know, it may have been broken up into Judah and Israel, but well, let's just say Israel for for simplicity's sake. And then you got Jerusalem, which is like the capital, um, if you will, uh, the the center point of it. And if you were a Jew, you may have not lived in Jerusalem. Um, you right. may have lived way over here. And but you're still uh, called to come to Jerusalem for the festivals and to present your offerings. So you would make a journey from wherever you are to Jerusalem, and that. And so yeah, I, I think that's what you know from the vantage point of a doorkeeper. He's recounting all of these journeys that he sees people take, and uh, in these journeys, um, they go through valleys, uh, and uh, he calls this one the Valley of Baca. Uh, like I mentioned. There's debate on if this is a, a literal place or not. There's two that, that I saw, I can't remember the names of it, that they referenced in other scripture, that they think that this may have been referring to, um, where uh, it describes a valley with these um, type of weeping trees. Uh, but there's no there's no overt, this is the Valley of Baca. Gotcha. Um, so... So he could have been referring to a place, or he could have just been referring generally to valleys. Mm-hmm. And then giving a poetic metaphor of the Valley of Baca, the Valley of Weeping, um, as they travel through it. But then comparing it to our, our journey. Right. Um, you know, as people go on physical journeys to the temple, um, we all have our own spiritual journeys that we're going through on our way to um, true Zion, you know, the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, mm-hmm. dwelling place of God. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought that was really good, and you brought up the, uh, the <coughs> afflictions, mm-hmm. right? Uh, whether they're physical, spiritual, uh, mental, emotional, all those different, um, you know, trials, tribulations, troubles that we we tend to have uh, in life, and uh, that those things are to be expected. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're not things that uh, that we can avoid, right? We like to avoid them uh, if we can, but. Uh, hardships come, right? Life happens. Yep. Uh, yep. Sometimes. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I'm with you. Uh, if there was never another affliction in my life, it would be just fine with me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it would be great. Well, because it's like one of those things, you know, it's like when it rains, it pours mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of thing. And like, who wants to go through that? No one wants to go through that. Um, but scripture is just really clear across the board that you're going to go through that. Uh, and 
and there's not really a way around it, mm-hmm. um, which is where it's like scriptures like this and then partnered up with that Second Corinthians verse that I mentioned, the, the my grace is sufficient, is where I don't understand where the like the prosperity gospel is coming from, that you can just gain favor out of any suffering. Um, it's just if anyone was to gain favor out of suffering, it would have been Paul. Right. right? Uh, and Paul, uh, God very clearly said, nope. You're going to deal with it, yeah. Uh, and so I don't, I, I don't. They're just to me, they're just blatantly ignoring scripture. Um, whenever they say you can just faith your way out of anything, um, even the scripture, like it, it doesn't say you're not going to go through the valley. It says God's strength is going to take you through the valley. Mm-hmm. And so it's just kind of changing that that mindset, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, uh, in verse 6, as they go through the Valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. Which is interesting. I yeah. I read this passage probably 10 times before I saw that verse right there. Um, <coughs> when I was studying it, it's like, they make it a place of springs. Like, oh, whoa, that's interesting. Springs are nice. And so, like, Valley of Weeping, you know, it's dreary and, you know, rainy or, or whatever it is. And, and they're like, hmm. Let's relax while we're here. <laughs> this looks like a great place for a resort. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's get refreshed while we're here. Mm-hmm. And that's just such a counterintuitive thought um, yeah. to that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it really is. Um, and, you know, as much as we don't like afflictions, uh, God uses those right yeah. for our good. Yeah. Um, so there was... Um, uh, there was a guy that was asking for prayer uh, for his friend recently who's uh, not a believer but is clearly going through uh, several different afflictions. And so the prayer request was, uh, you know, maybe to help alleviate uh, that God would alleviate some of those afflictions uh, and and uh, give that guy some rest, and then he would maybe get a taste of uh, of God's rest. Mm-hmm. And I think in a lot of, a lot of times the way that God works instead is in those afflictions, right? We get a sense of how inadequate that we are all on our own. Mm -hmm. And then it really pushes us to rely and trust on him and in his strength and in his goodness and uh, in his finished work Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately. And then rely on him for strength, just like Paul. Yeah. Like Paul did. Well, and that, you know, that my grace is sufficient for you. um, Verse, uh, there's been times in my life that I've uh, prayed and received sufficient grace to get through it for, you know, a week or a, a day or, or whatever. And like, you know, I pray to God and I'm good. Mm-hmm. I'm good uh, to keep going. And then there's been times in my life that I pray to God for sufficient grace to get through it. And it lasts all of five minutes. And then I'm right back to God. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so... It's like one of those things that, you know, just to to uh, lean on your point there, that, that those afflictions are at times used to uh, make you realize your dependence on God. Yeah. Um, they get our attention, if yeah. nothing else, don't yeah. they? Yeah. Yeah, it's usually, uh, you know, it's you know, almost a trope, uh, mm-hmm. but, yeah. you yeah. know, you know, people find God, oh, what, what, what did they say? It's... um. You know, no one's an atheist in the trenches or something like that in the war yeah. or whatnot. Uh, you know, it's it's when you experience true loss and suffering that usually kind of jars you awake mm-hmm. um, to to life. Yeah, it shocks us, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, and I uh, yeah, and I like the way that you tied Paul into it. Uh, here's a comic uh, for you. I'll show everybody else. Mm-hmm. Hey, Paul. Okay, hey Paul, uh, what are you doing? Uh, writing a letter, Paul. Let's get the one oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so here, Paul is chained up in prison with SpongeBob, <laughs> who is annoying him. <laughs> Paul, I was given a thorn in my flesh. It's SpongeBob with his yes. goofy laugh and everything else. <laughs> SpongeBob is the thorn in the flesh. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, tormenting him. Um, uh, I thought that was funny. Yeah, I find it funny the people that. There's like all sorts of debate on what the thorn in the flesh is, mm-hmm. and we don't know. No, no, I don't. I mean, you, you can make guesses. Could have been SpongeBob. It could, you know, the Bible. Doesn't Bible say. doesn't say it wasn't SpongeBob. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so, I mean, technically, it, it, it's just as likely that SpongeBob as anything else. Um. <laughs> uh, yes. Exactly. It's, yeah. It's stupid. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, let's move on, yep. shall we? All right. Yep. The third point, God is our joy. I almost made this point a different one. Can you guess what it is? Hmm. Go on and tell me. Uh, I almost made it God is our purpose. Um, uh, kind of digging into the the backstory of Korah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, being discontent with where God had him and the job that he had and, and uh, you know, the son of Korah being content with the job that God has had him and making it where his purpose isn't his job, his purpose is God. Mm-hmm. And that's where he's found contentment. Um, but I decided to leave it. God is our joy. Um, I think those are tied up together. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, anyways, so yeah, uh, God is our joy. Um yeah, the, the that shift in the legacy of uh, of Cora, uh, I thought was a really great great way to tie in and mm-hmm. uh, even help to explain like, okay, why why in the world are the sons of Cora writing psalms of all things? That doesn't make any sense because they're angsty all. teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, because they're a, a garage band maybe or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, with Cora's uh, the the history of Cora. Right, being in full on, uh, you know, back in uh, the Exodus generation, being in full rebellion against uh, against God. Right? Mm-hmm. It's not really about Moses; it was about God. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, that full on rebellion, because of the discontent that Korah and his people that he stirred up had, versus the contentment that you find here with the sons of Korah, is like night and day. Yeah. I thought that was excellent. Well, and it's um, it's really tricky. So, so just really quickly, uh, just in case you didn't hear in the sermon, um, Korah, the the start of Korah was back in with Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness, and Korah was assigned to be um, the maintainer of the items within the the tent meeting. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that was his job. Korah didn't like that. Korah wanted to be a priest, but couldn't be a priest because he wasn't a descendant of Aaron. So Korah uh, and a group of his friends rebelled against Moses and God because of that, and eventually ended up getting swallowed up. But um, so, so effectively, it was Korah was discontent with the job assigned to him by God. Now, this is something that we don't always correlate to in, in our culture. So, for all of history, you did what you did. Yep. Um, uh, so, like back then, it was. It was um, if you were a Levite, you worked the temple. That was your job, and, and depending on which descendant uh, path of Levites is what you did within that. Um, but even past that, even outside of uh, uh, the Bible or the Israelites, you did what your dad did. Mm-hmm. <coughs> our our last names come from with the job that we did, right? Uh, what was building? Uh, <laughs> um, comes from the English. Uh, belled on uh-huh. or belled in, uh-huh. uh, and it shifted when they came to America. But uh, we're going to make our own path. There was a yeah. there was a hall, like there mm-hmm. was uh, some lordship there somehow. I think mm-hmm. if I remember right. Uh, anyway, but past that, because uh, I, I did an ancestry dot com nice. deal one time, it was like twelve or fifteen years ago, and it was fun because I got all the way back. I think it was to the twelfth century. And then uh, there was an ancestor named Ulf. And then after that, the trail's dark. <laughs> it's like, like yeah. random Viking <laughs> right. or something. Anyway. But you did yeah. what your dad did, right? Um, so if your dad was a blacksmith, you were a blacksmith. If your dad was a farmer, you were a farmer. If your dad was a shepherd, you were a shepherd. That was just generally speaking, for the majority of history, that's what happened. And um, so this concept of, I'm going to go make my own path and choose my own way just wasn't a thing for the most part. Uh, people didn't have the luxury to do that. Um, uh, but, or sorry, so um, it was kind of the thought of, you know, if you were a shepherd, that's that's what God has for you. It's like you're, you're going to be a shepherd. And, and I think for the most part, people have more content in that just because the choice was removed. However, today, 
It's endless. We have choices. You have as many choices as you want. Judah, how many nights have you stayed up wondering, what am I going to do with my life? Every day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not just confined to night. It's daytime to you. Um, that's, Constantly. Well, because so here's what we're, we're taught um, uh, growing up is, uh, what do you want to be? What do you want to be? Shoot for the stars. What do you want to be? And then you get into high school and they're like, get ready for college. Get ready for college. Go to college. Get the right degree so you can get the right job so you can be happy. And then here's a million different colleges and a million different degrees. And then you go choose a degree and like here's a million different jobs you can do off of that degree. And then you get into the job and you realize you don't even like the job. Right. Uh, and... And it's built up this this mindset of I find my happiness and my purpose in my job. Mm-hmm. And it causes like an identity crisis in people. Um, they're, like you, you go and you spend four or five years getting a degree, you go do the job, and all of a sudden the job's not what you thought it was going to be. And so now you're like, what do I do? Mm-hmm. I've just wasted $40,000 in you know, four years of my life. To do something I don't even like. Uh, it's like the promise that they gave me in high school isn't the truth. Right. Right. And, um, and so it's so, – so, so I think our society is a lot like Korah mm-hmm. um, in that we're seeking happiness, joy, and contentment and purpose in what we do. Right. And um, well, and I think yeah. it, that's even uh, – people don't even make it out of college before that starts to hit. Mm-hmm. So I, I think – I read one time like the average – the average amount of times that uh, people, undergraduate students, change their major is like eight times oh, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. It's like sky high because they'll get into this one field of study and realize, oh, this isn't my dream job. Mm-hmm. And then so they'll switch. Mm-hmm. And so it – goes from being a four-year degree to like a six, seven-year degree a lot mm-hmm. of the times because they're trying to find what is it that I really love to do. Yeah, because and- every job, every job has glamorous parts and not so glamorous parts. That's right. That's right? right. And so it's like, it's like for example, um, I took a forensic science class in college, uh, which if you don't know is like... If you watch CSI, mm-hmm. like that's forensic science. Um, you come into a crime scene, you evaluate it and and figure out, try to determine what happened in that crime scene. I, actually, I love the class because they would take us to a home and they simulated like a murder. And uh, so we had to go in and document the the crime scene and then give our conclusion on what we believe happened based off the evidence. It sounds cool. Yeah. I love CSI. Um, w- the reality, so, so that's the cool part of it. The reality is we spent hours <laughs> documenting and writing up reports. That 90% of our job in that was writing down everything. And I hated it. <laughs> and so it's one of those things that people are like, oh, forensic science, that's cool. I want to go do that. When in reality, 90% of it is pretty unglamorous. Right. Um, same thing with ministry. Like, uh, a lot of people see the the Sunday morning of ministry. So, like, so, so people see the 40 minutes that I spoke on Sunday morning, but they don't see the 10 hours of prep that went into that sermon. Mm-hmm. Or they don't see the hours of uh, coordinating people or talking with people or counseling people. And there's lots of, like unglamorous parts to that job. Um, same thing with teachers. Yeah. Like, you know, you, you see the, you're like, oh, I want to affect students' lives and, <laughs> like, build the next generation. And you don't see the um, parent-teacher conferences <laughs> that you have to do. <laughs> yeah. um, I always enjoyed those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're like, how triggered can I make these guys uh, as I talk right. to them? Uh, uh, yeah, it was, uh, especially on the years where, like if you teach the same thing seven times a day, it gets boring. Mm-hmm. It's monotonous. Mm-hmm. It's like, dude, I don't know. This is mind numbing. I don't know how much longer I can do this. It's like I need to do something to spur on a parent teacher conference just to make sure that I know I'm still alive. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just to mix up my day a little I, bit. I was good for one every other year, maybe. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, or you know you don't see the uh, it's Friday afternoon and you've got a stack of papers this. Yeah, high to yeah. grade because uh, mm-hmm. some reason you thought it'd be a good idea to sign all of them an essay at once and like oh now I gotta read these and grade them 
yeah. which is always fun because the kids or, would like test you. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, they'll write pretty good for a minute and then like, you know, like mm-hmm. basically copy down and they'll do little tricks. They don't think you'll actually read it. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I actually read them. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I'm like, wrong, wrong, wrong. Nice. Hand them back. Like, you read it? Like, yeah. Yes, I read it. Come yep. on. Anyway. I digress. Yeah. There's there's unglamorous things there's about ungla- everything. Yeah. Uh, so, like, Judah is interested in going into, like, audio engineering and stuff. Uh, there was a time in my life that I did that on the side, uh, did video and audio engineering. And the glamorous part of that is, oh, I get to go record people and, and mix stuff. The unglamorous side of it is dealing with people. <laughs> Man, this one guy I dealt with... Uh, I charged him way too little to deal with it, but I'd spent hours, hours editing this video and audio sent to him. And then he kicks it back with like all of the things that's wrong with it. And so now I have to deal with the unglamorous side of things of actually talking to, to this guy and, and trying to rectify um, making audio decisions that I don't think is the right thing to do, but he tried to check. And so, yep. so we got to compromise and work with it. There's unglamorous parts to every job. Which is why they pay you, yeah, right? right. Yeah, so if, like, uh, I plunge toilets around here. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you are the sons of Cora. Which, You're, yeah. yeah, it reminds me. I actually have one to do upstairs when we're done with this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, and if the thought process is, I find my happiness, my joy, and con- my contentment, and my purpose in my job, you will be so disappointed Ooh. in life, no matter what the job is. Because every job has parts to it that are just so annoying to deal with. Uh, and that's life. Like, that, that's, that's the curse. You know, in Genesis, was it three, where it says, um, cursed is the ground. Like, like, your work is no longer going to be easy. Your work is going to work against you because of sin. And, and that, that applies to everything. And so... Especially plumbing. Yeah, right? Uh, <laughs> trying to find that leak. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, so that's where the sons of Korah in the psalm just get it so right, is that he's a doorkeeper, nothing glamorous about his job. No one probably aspires to be a doorkeeper. Uh, would, and he is the happiest guy around. Why? Because he's not finding his purpose and his joy in his job. He's finding his purpose and his joy in God. Amen. Yeah. There we go. Rant over yes. about. I get so frustrated with the way that we view jobs uh, and the way I view jobs. Um, I there was an illustration that I didn't even have time to get to um, about uh, that was my life after college. Um, I thought I was going to marry this girl that I've been dating for a couple of years. I thought I was going to go into full time ministry doing music. Immediately after college, we broke up. <laughs> uh, couldn't find a job in ministry, so I was. Uh, Playing piano here, uh, working part time teaching at Lake Country Christian School, and working part time teaching or not teaching, uh, selling computers at Best Buy. And uh, over the year, I just grew super bitter because uh, the promise that was given to me did not come true, and so uh, there was full of discontentment because you know life wasn't what I thought it was going to be, and um, I had to learn with God's grace. To become content in what I, I had to learn to become content in where God had placed me in life, which wasn't where I thought it was going to be. And I'm really glad that I learned to be content in what I didn't want to do because whenever I did find myself in the full time ministry, I had learned this is not where I find my contentment. So when I came into frustrations, it's okay because this isn't like like I've learned to be content like Paul says I've learned to be content in the little in the low uh and so I can be content in the high uh and so yeah so, yep sounds good and that's basically the the summary even yep right? to find our contentment our our joy rest our strength. asher asher yeah. uh, f- uh we flourish whenever we're um when our our hope is in the lord and not in us uh, in any way, shape, or form, mm-hmm. right? Whether that's circumstances, jobs. Lest sort of we become Cora. Right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, the earth open up and swallow us whole. Yeah, because if God has assigned you to be, you know, for me, if God has assigned me to be a salesman at Best Buy for that season of my life, me rebelling against that is effectively doing the same thing that Cora did. It's saying, God, no, I don't trust what you have in my life right now. 
I'm rebelling against that. And that doesn't mean that you have to be like stagnant in right. your life. It doesn't mean that, that if, uh, if you, you know, think that you should do this job over here to not pursue that, but it's the mindset of, I'm not going to be discontent with where God has placed me, um, and rebel against that. Mm-hmm. Lest you be swallowed up by the by the earth and fire come out. Um, yeah, everybody else stand back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like the way that you motion. Yeah. The earth's about to open up. Y'all stand back. Yeah. Y'all stand back. That was great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very visual. I yeah. liked it. That's probably how it actually went. Like, y'all just <laughs> take three big steps back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Moses poses it as a. This might happen. It's gonna happen. <laughs> Moses says, take three steps back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, awesome. All right. Yep. That's it. Awesome. Um, well, let's move on then. Bad Doctrine of the Week. Bad Doctrine of the Week. Play the Play thing the clip. right here. It's the Bad Doctrine of the Week. Okay. We are finishing up our Bad Doctrine of the Week series through the Sparkle Creed I'm excited. I'm tired of talking about the Sparkle Creed. <laughs> I'm tired of talking about it, too. <laughs> and we're going to finish it up today. If you haven't been with us uh, the past seven weeks or whatever, uh, and if you've, if you've never seen the Sparkle Creed, we're going to show it right now. Let us confess our faith today in the words of the Sparkle Creed. I believe in the non-binary God whose pronouns are plural. I believe in Jesus Christ, their child, who wore a fabulous tunic and had two dads and saw everyone as a sibling child of God. I believe in the rainbow spirit who shatters our image of one white light and refracts it into a rainbow of gorgeous diversity. I believe in the church of everyday saints as numerous, creative, and resilient as patches on the ace quilt, whose feet are grounded in mud and whose eyes gaze at the stars in wonder. I believe in the calling to each of us that love is love is love. So, beloved, let us love. I believe, glorious God, help my unbelief. Amen. All right, so there's the Sparkle Creed. We've talked about the non-binary God, right? We've talked about oh, yeah. um, Jesus' two dads. We've talked about the AIDS quilt. We've talked about the fabulous tunic. We've talked about um, the grounded in mud, wandering stars, whatever. <laughs> Uh, we've talked about the rainbow spirit, um, all those weird... AIDS quilt. The AIDS quilt, all those weird things. And then we've got the final statement. Uh, what was it say? Um, I believe, glorious God, help my unbelief. Amen. Now, Amen. Amen. Uh, I believe, glorious God, help my unbelief. Now, whenever me and Judah were in here, uh, the very first day that we were going to do the Sparkle Creed, I was reading through it, and I told Judah I th- that last statement. I think that's the only good part of this... Um, this creed is, I believe, glorious God, help my unbelief. Do you uh, have any opening thoughts? I do have opening thoughts, but first I want to hear your thoughts. You want to hear my thoughts? Okay. I'd love to hear your thoughts. So this is based on uh, a a verse in Mark. Yeah. Um, so there's this uh, passage um, with Jesus and this uh, guy had a, a sick, uh, I think demon-possessed son, and uh, the... The disciples tried to cast out the demon and heal the son. It couldn't happen, so he brought him to Jesus and said, Jesus, your disciples weren't able to do this. Can, can you do this? And Jesus rebuked him pretty hard and said, you unbelieving generation, like, like essentially, how long must I put up with you? Right? Yep. Um, it's, <laughs> it's when Jesus started to get a little bit more edgy in how he was responding to Israel. Part of the unglamorous part of Jesus' job. <laughs> part of the unglamorous part of Jesus' job. Uh, and so, so basically, it was all framed as it's your unbelief as to why this hasn't been taken care of yet. Because he had already seen the disciples, and God had given the disciples the um, the ability to do these things, uh, but they weren't able to. And so, there's this interaction between Jesus and this guy, where Jesus chastised him for his unbelief, and which then leads to the statement where this guy says, "I believe." help my unbelief. And it's this paradox statement. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and and the way that I kind of see that is this like already but not yet 
kind of thing of like, like I do have faith in you. Help me where I don't have faith in you. Mm -hmm. Um, And so comparing that to here, if I was to isolate that statement, that's a good statement, right? That's, that's a statement of all of us uh, of, I have faith in God, but there's parts of my life that I could have more faith mm-hmm. in God. So it's like, God, I believe in you, like in the Valley of Bacchus. God, I believe in you. Help me where I don't believe in you. Right? Okay. Agreed. So, so that's my thought. Uh, yeah, and you, I think you caught on to what I was about to say. Um, okay, well, which one? So yeah. you, you, go, you said, you know, taken in uh, isolation. Yeah. <laughs> this is a great, this yeah. is, yeah, this, it's biblical, yeah. right? Uh, pretty clearly. It may be the only biblical statement. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, in isolation. In isolation. In isolation. Yeah. Uh, the problem for me is the context in okay. which we find this. <laughs> so I believe, it starts, I believe in the non-binary God whose pronouns are plural. I believe in Jesus oh, Christ, okay. their child. I, I see what you're so saying. So at yeah. the end, uh-huh. it says, I believe, the, the, it's implying I believe all of these things that are here in the sparkle create yeah. help okay. my unbelief. And so, uh, I, for that reason, I don't like it. <laughs> okay. I hear you. I <laughs> just hear the you. context. But Makes no, sense. I, I 100% agree. If you just will take that out, if we could cherry pick that out, biblical, yeah. yes. This is something that is good for us. Yeah. In context of the Sparkle Creed, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, I hear you. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, which is interesting, now that you mention it, in, in the context of a creed, that's not really a creed statement. Right. Uh, even in itself, it's more of a faith statement. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, if it's if it's piggybacking on, I believe this, I believe this, I believe this, I believe, help my unbelief, implying when I say I believe, it's all these right. things. I hear you. Yeah, yeah. Bad, bad, bad doctrine. <laughs> bad, bad doctrine of the week. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, do you have anything easy. else to say? Um, on that one? I'm so glad we're done with the Sparkle Creed. I think we have given yeah. it more than enough attention. Uh, it was fun yeah. while it lasted. But. We are done with the Sparkle Creed. I've got a a note in my phone of upcoming bad doctrines that I just write down as I see them, and I shared one with you last or yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. That's just fun. <laughs> um, and so uh, we've got some fun bad doctrines coming up. But if you have a bad doctrine, let us know. Down there, and we love to talk about it because everyone says dumb stuff all the time. <laughs> right. And it's fun to just take the dumb things that people say and compare them against scripture. Absolutely. Uh, to figure out uh, where our unbelief needs to be assisted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, anyways, do you got anything? Uh, but if, oh, which, which, by the way, if you're still watching, one of the faithful and few, uh, we're going to take a three week break. Uh, we're in the uh, we're in the holidays, and uh, so so for the next three weeks, no bad dark or no uh, no digging deeper. We'll come back for season two um, uh, in January. Um, so that being said, do you have anything to add before we go on break? Um, man, uh, first off, I thought uh, Psalm eighty four and and the sermon was excellent. It was oh, great. Thank you. I'd like to take credit, but. It was the right. Bible. It's God's word. Yeah. You know, it's hard to go wrong. Yeah. Uh, but no, I thought I thought it was great. And I thought you did a great job explaining and laying those points out. Um and really I guess the only other thing is, you know, hope everybody has a Merry Christmas and a happy new year and see y'all next time. Yeah. Judah, you got anything? Uh Merry Christmas. They need to see you. They they can't oh. even see you. Merry Christmas. Like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's a, a great way to give us a Christmas present. Yeah, that's the year. Christmas present that you can give us. So I can subscribe. <laughs> that would make so Judah gets paid based off of subscribers. Uh, I get paid. <laughs> he gets paid in. I don't know, what can we give him? Not uh, money. Your treasure is in heaven. Yeah, you get jewels. <gasps> Chris's brownies. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> I tried. All right. Thank y'all for joining us. Y'all have a great Christmas. We'll see y'all next year.